The Andes Mountains start in Colombia and run all the way through the continent on this side to the south in Patagonia. Uh, it starts mildly in Colombia and then in Ecuador the mountains become higher. You got some very big volcanoes like Chimborazo and Cotopaxi. And into Peru it, the mountain range becomes wider and bigger. Some of the biggest mountains are here at Huaraz, uh, Huascaran, which is about six and a half thousand meters high. And then towards the south of Peru, the mountain range becomes very wide and, and it forms the Altiplano, which is uh, a bit like the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and then Bolivia and the north of Argentina and Chile, this is all desert above 3,000 meters with volcanoes and mountains rising up to five, 6,000 meters. And you've got the salt lake is here too. And this landscape, I think, is the most interesting part of it. Uh, because then when, when you go south, the Andes becomes more milder and there's still very big mountains. I think this, the highest mountain in South America is here. Uh, what was the name again? I have to write it down. And then here it becomes a very thin stroke, which is a bit more like the Alps in Europe. And towards the south, like the Carretera Austral, this, this looks a bit like there's a lot of fjords here and the mountains are lower. And on this side it's very green, on the other side it's sort of desert. Okay, where was I? South America. Uh, Colombia. So I landed in Bogota and I ended up staying there a couple of weeks for the same reasons I was in, um, in Mexico City and in uh, San Francisco. Um, it's another huge city, I think like 8 million people. It's, it's a very pleasant climate because it's high up, about 2500 meters. And one big surprise was is that it's the most bicycle friendly city I think in South America. It has the longest bicycle network. And um, on Sundays they would block all of the main roads in the city for cyclists and pedestrians. So every Sunday from 7 in the morning till 2, the roads were closed. And it was just amazing to witness everyone was going outside. It was really a moment of the week where it was sort of quiet in the city from traffic. And everyone was running and cycling and just hanging out in the middle of the road. Uh, great vibe because like the traffic can be very intense in such cities you know there's Bogota doesn't have uh, expressways or freeways very much so all the traffic is in is on the smaller roads made some friends Paula who was an activist uh, yeah she was cool and her friend had a clothing brand and they asked if I wanted to do a photo shoot together with them um, Yes, we had a lot of fun in Candelaria, which is the, um, the, the historic heart of the city uh, with a lot of beautiful murals and colonial buildings. Um, really nice place to stay. Bogota gave me a lot of energy and um, after four weeks I hit the road again and went pretty straight for Ecuador because I was looking forward to, um, to some off-road riding. And uh, Ecuador is known to cyclists for the TEMBER, which stands for Trans-Ecuador Mountain Bike Route. It's a beautiful route through the Andes and it goes through villages and just some uh, long volcanoes up and down, high up in the mountains. It's quite an adventure. The route is created by Cass Gilbert, his Instagram is while out riding and he has a lot of inspirational uh, content. The route starts in a national reserve called El Angel, which is full of these very special plants. And um, it's a plant that only grows in, in Ecuador and a few parts of Colombia and Venezuela, I believe. Um, and it's full of it and it's beautiful. They have like this fluffy leaves that are look like bunny ears. And it goes up to 3,300 meters, then it goes down again towards Otavalo, which is a well-known indigenous population, little town, where people have these beautiful garments and a really distinguished style of hats and 
dresses and colors. It's a really beautiful place. And the route goes like there's almost no pavement. It's all gone into the mountains, into these local towns. And it's really beautiful, but it's, it's, it's tough too, because it's, it's a lot of climbing and the road quality is bad. So there's really two sides to it. It's a different game from what I'm used to. I've been shipping some stuff ahead, which I'm, I'm doing more often now. So, so my, my MacBook and some electronics and clothes I don't need, I put in the two panniers and I, I ship them ahead with a courier for a few days and then I catch up again. And it's a good way to lighten the load for some rougher sections. Um, I been climbing up like 600 meters now already. It's been very steep, this beautiful view. But it's, uh, it's tough, man. I just don't wanna, wanna go back to the Pan American Highway. <laughs> yeah. I've been walking most of the morning and resting. Walking and resting, a bit of cycling, cursing. Um, yeah. I hope it gets better. I just, I'm not feeling right. I'm not feeling like doing this right now. It is quite beautiful, I just need to take my time. It's taking me longer than I thought. 40 kilometers per day, sometimes 30. Like today is not gonna be much, so much climbing. It's just what it is. Yeah, it's often hard to find the motivation and, and and stay in the moment if you are climbing those hills. And they, those are big hills, especially coming from uh, more paved roads. Like in Colombia, I did almost only paved roads. And you make the progress. It's a, it's a completely different momentum and feeling. And I was happy to make the choice to, to do more off-road in Ecuador because you see much more of the local culture, like the farm, the little farms and the families living there. You meet a lot of people. Um, and it's really nice, but at the same time, it just there's another hill you have to climb. And then knowing that 200 kilometers away, there's the Pan American Highway, which just, just cuts through the mountains beautifully. Um, and you think like, oh, I, can, I could make much more progress, but you have to really get into the moment and get up that hill again. It's um, motivation. Um, yes, so I didn't go I didn't take the Pan American Highway there uh, because I'd heard about this route that goes around Cotopaxi, which is one of the biggest volcanoes in, in Ecuador. So the original route goes sort of east from the mountain, close to the Pan American Highway, this way. And this is where the Pan American runs. It runs down there through the, through the valley. Um, but there was a good mountain bike track I heard about that goes this way of Cotopaxi. And this is all, this is a no man's land. There's nothing there. Uh, just no roads, no electricity, no houses, nothing. So it sounded like an adventurous route I wanted to try out.
Look at these cows over there. They're already running for me. How far is it away? 200 meters, 300 meters. Maybe more. Tell something about how deserted this place is. Buenos dias. This is the road, which uh, it's not much of a road, isn't it? Came from there yesterday, camped there, and um, yeah, it's going really slow because it's so like up and down through little puddles and constantly searching for the road. Actually, I have to look on my phone to track where if I'm still on the right path. Um, so yesterday I was afraid my phone was going to die. Because if so, I don't know where to go. It's going to be searching. Three days I was in this no man's land, and especially that last ridge I needed to get over, 4,200 meters. It just took the breath out of my lungs, like literally, like I had to push the bike because it was steep. And just 50 meters, and then I needed to have just a little break because I was just, I think I was underfed, I was having trouble with the altitude, it was all new to me. Uh, this was the first time the Andes was getting really high and um, it was just too much. Yeah, it was some beautiful days of cycling through the backcountry. Um, but it was getting rougher because the rain season was about to start again. Uh, I, I totally misplanned that this journey. Um, rain season in Central America is in summer, so June, June July and August. But then in Ecuador, in Peru, Bolivia, that part, it sort of starts in November and goes on until February, early March, the rain season. So I just, I was in all of the rain seasons. <laughs> uh, but in Colombia and Ecuador, it, it was okay. It was just starting. But it was going to get worse. And I was cycling towards Chimboraza which is the, the highest volcano of, uh, of Ecuador and actually the highest mountain of the world if you measure it from the equator because the earth is not completely round it's, it's, it's slightly wider uh, on the equator and Chimboraza is almost on the equator um, I, I thought like, oh this is going to be amazing the road goes up to 4400 meters and I think I'm going to photograph it and have drone shots and, but I I've never seen the mountain. It was covered in clouds. It was looking quite epic though, because there was a huge thunderstorm, a hailstorm actually, and I, like at the highest point of the road, 4,400 meters. 4,400 meters in the rain. This is a uh, Chimborazo. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, so that's very often that you plan like, oh, I'm gonna photograph this and this, and I'm looking very much forward to it but nature takes and gives um, you never know what's gonna happen 
For navigation, there's a few apps I use. Um, Google Maps, mostly for services. Maps Me, which is OpenStreetMaps, and MapPad, which is my favorite one. Uh, also based on OpenStreetMap. This is Maps Me, and every day I put a marker of where I spend the night, which gives you an idea how much distance I do in a day, you know, starting from Vancouver. Um, and this was more backcountry, so it goes slower. Here it goes slower as well because it's going up and down Highway 1 along the coast. And in the desert on these paved roads, I go a little bit faster. And especially I could hear in Ecuador and Peru, it went so slow at times because here I was following a mountain bike track. So these distances are not more than 40 kilometers a day or something. Yeah, Maps Me is great if you just if you go for a very small town and you look for a grocery or a bakery or any services and you don't have internet. Um, this just shows a lot of detail. Like here, it's a little town in Ecuador. It shows a little bakery, there's a hostel here, there's a hostel there. I like MapPad because it's visually very, very good. You see, it's a bit like Google Terrain, but it has more detail. It's offline, so you need to pre-download all the map. And the great thing of this is that you can easily just draw maps. For example, like that. You draw a map by dragging it and it sticks to the road, right? Up there, maybe. Done. Save. And for example, you can draw a few rides and then compare them with each other because here you can see how long that is, what the elevation profile is, just very quickly. What I like about it is when you've drawn a route, you can just click it and it shows just what's on the screen, the profile. So for example, if you're thinking like, oh, I want to take a break somewhere there maybe, you can just click and then you can adjust it and just look at the section you just selected. And then you can see, for example, if you're here and you want to get there, you can just very quickly see, okay, this is 376 meters climbing and seven kilometers. I could make that before, I don't know, before dark, for example. I don't use just one app. I just kind of juggle b between the apps because they are good, f they have all their own purposes and it just depends on the landscape and just where you are. Like sometimes a road is not on Google Maps. For example, the, the road to my cabin in Italy, the, the track is not on Google Maps, but it is on OpenStreetMaps. Map out is only for Apple. Uh, iPhone so but I've known Android users they like to use Alpine Quest uh, I haven't used it myself but I heard it's a good app I know a lot of people use Komoot but I I don't know it I, I started using it in Ecuador and I didn't have much internet there so I needed to plan the route in the hostel uh, but I like to change the route I like to be able to change the route when I'm on the road and then you need internet so it didn't really work for me, but I heard it's a very good app.
aquí últimamente, pero bueno, yo sigo pensando que Rafael fue falso conmigo. Pero bueno, vamos a dejar las cosas atrás, vamos a competir y vamos a hacerlo lo mejor para el equipo y yo voy a sacar mi punto siempre posible. I just threw up all my food. <laughs> ah, food poisoning. And I feel everything has to come out. So, it stops the... It stops this tour for a bit. I have to take a bus. I'm not gonna cycle up to 4,000 to 4,500 meters. <sighs> I need to take a break. It's not a good place to have food poisoning. I think I have to go out in a minute again. <coughs> Alright, that happens. It's been a while. So. Good morning, or not so good morning. I had a fairly good sleep. A few times I needed to get out to um, I've decided to move on and not go back and try to catch a bus. Because if I, get, if I find a bus, and I'm not sure if I find it because they're all very small, so they probably can't take the bike. And then it's still gonna take like six hours to cut us these bad roads, so that's not gonna be fun. So I'm gonna continue, but I have to climb to 4,400 meters. Uh, which is 600 meters up, and then it's going down from there. And in 50 kilometers through will be a little town. Um, maybe I'll make that, it's gonna be tough, because my stomach is empty, and I don't know if I'm gonna keep any food inside, so... It's gonna be very tough. to the highest point oh man it's so bad it's so cold here it's 4400 meters fucking hailstorm okay it's a little bit more up and it goes down I hope it goes dry I made it to Korongo which was the town I was I was heading to, which is also still on high altitude, about 4,000 meter. That ride was just, I don't know how I did it on an empty stomach, climbing such altitudes. Um, but I guess at some point you just don't have a choice and, and you do it. And the weather was horrible, but uh, yeah, I made it. Um, and then I took a break in Korongo for a day, had a very good meal. And after that, it was just, it couldn't be a bigger contrast. The downhill towards Caras, which, which goes down for about 2,500 meters. It's a long downhill and it's beautiful. I maybe was the most beautiful downhill on the journey. Again, look at this. 
what I love about this landscape is you jump from different landscape to different landscape within a day, you know, what I, where I was yesterday, because the altitude changed so many different landscapes. Like this is like very dry and red, and so beautiful. Once you're in the valley, it was 1,200 meters where the river runs. It's just so nice and warm and much more pleasant. There's oxygen again. And I cycle up to Caras, which is in the center of the Cordillera Blanca. And it's a nice tourist town, which has good restaurants. And took a little break there and got a bit stronger. It's a, it's a really nice place to, to organize hikes and some trips. I mean, it's just that area is, it's just a storm of mountains. It's such a wild place. And uh, when you visit Peru, you really have to put it on your list. I celebrated my birthday, did a ride on Christmas Day and closed the year. <laughs>